Okay, are you going to translate in German or does everyone speak English? We speak English. Oh, wow. You Germans are so smart. Oh, wow. Um, well, to all of you, it's a great privilege for me to be here. Um, and um, I always count it a blessing, especially to uh, do anything associated with Peter and Nathaniel. We have such great respect for them and for their ministries. And um, today, things that I will teach you, um, they may not be something new, or some of you may not think it's very profound, but I can assure you that very few ministers, even Bible-believing ministers today, actually practice the things that I'm going to talk about. And even those of us who do attempt to practice them uh, we are always growing, hopefully, as the reformers used to say in Latin, semper reformanda, we're, we're always beginning to see places where we're really not as biblical as we thought. And that's how we grow. And so I want us to look at a passage to begin with in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Um... Paul says, as you know, in the background here, Paul is having trouble with the church in Corinth. And um, many of the problems, I believe, in the church of Corinth is not just coming from the city. It's not just coming even from the congregation. But I believe that there are teachers behind many of Paul's problems. That there are um, men who have come in who are probably have a more, um, how can I say, influential physicality. Uh, they're bigger than Paul, uh, more handsome than Paul. Uh, they speak more eloquently than Paul. And um, they seem to be very astute. And the type of people who can really draw people to themselves, to their personalities. And I think that that this group of men, maybe a small group, maybe just two or three, are, are the reason behind many of Paul's problems. Uh, now, he says in, in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians, verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. And then he goes on to verse 7. I just want to mention this because it's part of the context. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. And this is very, very important. And uh, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then, um, and then we'll begin to look at this text. Father, I thank you for this great privilege to be here today to speak with these men and to offer something that I pray that you will make a help to your people. Father, help us all to live in greater conformity to your word. Your infallible, inerrant, sufficient word. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> now, in verse 1, uh, Paul says again, he says, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Um, one of the things that is apparent here is that these men who seem to be opposing Paul, they are not meek or gentle. They are intimidating men. And they are intimidating people, and they are probably trying to intimidate Paul. 
And what I want you to see is that Paul is not going to fight fire with fire. Paul is not going to change his personality and and stop being meek, stop being gentle. He is going to speak the truth. And he's going to allow the truth and the spirit of God working through the truth to fight for him. And I think this is very important because sometimes when we're faced with men who are not acting godly, we have a tendency to attack them the same way. We have a tendency to try to fight fire with fire. Now, in all cases, the minister of Christ must be firm. He must be strong. He must be willing to sacrifice. He must not back up. He must not compromise. But we should never cease manifesting the fruit of the spirit. And so Paul, he says, I urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold towards you when absent. Now, I don't believe this was the case at all. I believe this is what people were saying about Paul. When Paul was with them, he spoke the same truth and he spoke it in meekness and gentleness. When he wrote his letters, again, he spoke the same truth, but his enemies were accusing him of this. I don't think Paul ever changed from being meek and gentle. You and I never have an excuse to act like the world, to act like the fleshly man in order to fight the fleshly man. We must always fight the battles in the church with Christ-like character, with the word of God, and trusting that the word of God will be used by the Holy Spirit to do its work. Now, he says in verse 2, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, there are some people that are in this congregation that are saying Paul walks according to the flesh and Paul's going to have to deal with them, but he's giving them an opportunity here. He doesn't mean that he wants them to repent or he's going to come there and be very angry and attack these people. That's not what he's saying, but he is saying this. He he acknowledges that he is an apostle. He acknowledges that he has authority and he's going to work as an apostle. He's going to deal with the situation as apostle. He's going to deal with it with great authority, but it doesn't mean that he is going to lay aside his humility, his meekness and his gentleness. Now, as ministers of Christ, we must speak with authority, but our authority comes from our conformity in our speech to the word of God, our conformity in our character to the word of God, our conformity of our disposition to the word of God. Always remember that. Um, In the United States, in English, we say sometimes that when a man's getting ready to fight, he sticks out his chest and tries to make himself look bigger. That's not what we do in the ministry. When we have to deal with difficult situations, and intimidating people. They ought to see something of a contradiction in us. On one hand, they ought to see humility and gentleness. On the other hand, they ought to see authority by the way we use scripture that almost makes them afraid. They ought to see authority in the fact that we refuse to back up one step. Yet at the same time, we're not going to turn from a Christ-like disposition. Now, he goes on in verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Now, this is very, very important. There there is many ways in which many of the um, more charismatic teaching has done us great damage. There, there's many ways in which the charismatic teaching has um, robbed us of our inheritance. What you need to realize is this. If you're a Christian, 
you are supernatural. Your life is supernatural. If you're going to grow as a Christian, you will grow supernaturally. If you are to minister in this world, you are to minister supernaturally above nature. That is not a bad word. That's a good word. It's just many times people have taken that word and filled it full of fanaticism. You and I can accomplish nothing in the kingdom of God by human means. You and I can accomplish nothing in the flesh. We can accomplish nothing with clever strategies. We can accomplish nothing with personality. We can accomplish nothing with an impressive intellect. If we are to be used of God to accomplish something in his kingdom, it will be through our submission to his word, our proclamation of his word and intercessory prayer. It will be through dealing with carnal men, not as carnal men, but as godly men who have authority because of their knowledge of the scripture and their submission to it. Now. We live, you know, I don't know how it is in Germany, but the United States. Is a country of pragmatism. We are a country of. It doesn't matter how you do it. Just make sure you get the job done. You can use any way you want. But make sure that it works as long as it works. It's good. That has carried over into the ministry. So if someone has success in or called success in building a church that's 5000 people, everybody wants to know how did you do it? And normally it comes down to a person writing a book about their leadership skills. And that is so very wrong. That right there demonstrates pragmatism. Because the only thing that matters is not how someone built a large church, but what does scripture say about the duties of a minister of Christ? How is he supposed to live? How is he supposed to minister? That's all that matters. Nothing else. So please do not read books coming from America written by pastors who have grown mega churches. If you want to really do well, avoid those books at all costs. And read the scriptures. And determine what God has commanded you to do as a minister of Christ. And then let him take care of everything else. Now. Look in verse four. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Another way of saying this, you see. When you and I hear the word flesh. We automatically think of something that's wicked. And that can be the context here. But I also want you to look at something else. He, he could be saying for the weapons of our warfare are not human. They're not human. There is nothing. That humanity in itself, your humanity. Even your talents, there is nothing you can do to advance the kingdom of heaven. So the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They are not human. But divinely powerful. Now, this phrase divinely powerful literally means mighty before God. And that can mean that it's God who empowers them. But it also indicates that this is how God sees power. Men will look at certain talents and gifts that a person has and think they're very powerful, but we need to determine what God sees as powerful. And this is very, very important. God does not see your personality as powerful. He doesn't see your cleverness as powerful. He doesn't see your good looks as powerful. 
None of that is powerful. So we need to determine what is powerful before God. And we will see that it is the weapons that he has given us. God has given us certain weapons. And you have to make a choice, not only as a minister, but as a Christian. And this is the choice. Are you going to use God's armor or are you going to use the armor of King Saul? What armor are you going to use? King Saul, his armor and his weapons were very, very impressive. If you want to do that, go ahead. If you want to use the world's weapons, go ahead. They can look really impressive. But they'll never beat Goliath. David laid aside the armor and the weapons of Saul. And what did he do? He pulled out the weapon of choice. A few little stones. A slingshot. People would have thought that was absolutely insane. Well, today, if you reject the weapons, the pragmatism, of modern day evangelicalism and you determine to only use God's weapons, people are going to think you're foolish. They're going to think you're not practical. And you have to make a choice. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. They're not human. So when I read of some missionary strategy or church growth strategy that's been invented by a man, and that looks like something Walt Disney uses. Then we're not going to use it. Because it's of men. It is of the flesh. It is of the arm of the flesh. And they have no power. The weapons that Paul used were divinely powerful. You need to use the weapons that come from God and the weapons that are infused with God's power. Only they can destroy fortresses. Only they can destroy the fortresses of a fallen humanity and a fortress that is demonic. Only these weapons that God gives us. I want you to think about an illustration from Joshua. <coughs> it says this about Jericho. That Jericho was tightly shut up. No one went in and no one came out. It was tightly shut up. Some archaeologists say that the wall surrounding Jericho was so wide that you could race three chariots on that wall. There was no power on earth that could bring that wall down. None. How did they bring it down? The only way possible. The power of God. But how did that power of God manifest itself in something that appeared very, very weak? People simply obeying God, walking around Jericho, finally blowing a horn and shouting. And it wasn't the sound of the horn and it wasn't the stomp of their feet that created an earthquake. Horns and stomping feet will not create an earthquake that will bring down a wall of that size. I don't care how many people there are. It was a miraculous work of God. Now. The things that you have to do as a Christian, as a minister, I want you to understand this. They are utterly and totally impossible. And if you don't believe that. Then you're in trouble from the start. You must believe that everything you're called upon to do. In ministering and advancing the gospel is an absolute human impossibility. You must believe that there is absolutely nothing you can contribute to it. That all your so-called intelligences and talents and everything, they add up to zero. 
And that is why so many times throughout church history, God has used men. Who no one in this world would have ever chosen. In order to demonstrate that the power was all of God. If you study the scriptures from the Old Testament on, what do you see? Every time God chooses means that will prove that the success was his doing and had nothing to do with man. You know, look at Gideon. Who does God go after to defeat the Midianites? Someone who is hiding from the Midianites. And then when he gets an army, it's too big. Why is it too big? Because God says, if you won with this army, you would think that you'd done it. So I'm going to reduce it down to where you're going to go against the Midianites with an army that is so small, it will be impossible for you to defeat anyone. And then I'm going to step in and I'm going to defeat it. That that applies throughout all of Christianity It enters into the New Testament. It's, it's everywhere. It's in church history. God uses the man who cuts off, cuts himself off from the arm of the flesh. And trusts only in the power of the living God. And, and let me say this is very important. Ministry requires more. Than just good theology. Ministry requires more than you being able to recite to. Uh, to memorize and recite a confession. Ministry requires more than your massive intellect and knowledge of theology. Ministry requires power. Power. And it requires that we use those weapons that are powerful. Now, in verse five, he goes on. Look how Paul describes his ministry and probably is including here the apostolic ministry of uh, those who were with Paul. He says, we are destroying speculations. I mean, there are people with views so different from Christianity that you would think they would never be converted. And Paul says, we're destroying their speculations. We're destroying every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. He's not only doing it in his own life. But he's also doing it in his ministry, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Now, Paul is talking now, this is a man who's been called humble, ignorant, afraid. He's not much. A loser. Even church history tells us that Paul's appearance probably was anything other than impressive. His speech, Paul himself says he wasn't an eloquent speaker. But the power of God was manifested in his life. You see, it is it is advantageous. Not to have many gifts. What do I mean by that? I was never the smartest. I was never the quickest learner. If I go up to a pulpit and I start preaching and the power of God is not there, I will look like an idiot. I do not have anything to fall back on. If God does not move on my behalf, even when I'm witnessing to some little teenager in the park, if God does not help me. I can do nothing. I have no talent to fall back on. I have no great intellect. I have no great ability to argue anything. And if I use any weapon other than the weapons God has given me, I will look like a fool. And I will bear no fruit. So I think I praise God for my weaknesses. I praise God for my inability. I praise God for my even my lack of a mighty intellect. Because it causes me to cling to the only weapons I have. And that's why I pity so many men who are so 
brilliant. But no one's being converted. Lives aren't being changed. Because brilliance is not enough. And I want you to know, expository preaching is very, very important, but expository preaching is not enough. This is a supernatural work of the spirit of the living God. And we must cling to that. We have nothing. You know, the, the illustration that's always used, but it's very good. I will give. One million dollars. I will give one million dollars to any one of you. Who will go out to the graveyard. And I'll give you I'll give you a year. You go out to the graveyard and you preach to all those tombs. All those dead people. And if one person comes out of the tomb. I'll give you a million dollars. You know, it's not going to happen. You know, you cannot do that. Only God can raise the dead. But what you've got to see is the very same thing applies in preaching and ministry and evangelism. No one is going to get saved. Unless God moves, no one is going to grow unless God moves. And ministers are a hindrance to the salvation of people and ministers are a hindrance to the sanctification of believers whenever. They either do not use God's weapons or they use God's weapons and they use other weapons. That are of the flesh. The more a man separates himself from the worldly weapons that most evangelicals use the more that man will see the power of God. And that's just a fact. That is a fact. Now. We've talked a lot about weapons. What are they? Well. We could probably talk about this for several weeks. We'd go through every passage that dealt with it, but we don't have time for that. I want to give you the principal weapons that are given to every Christian and especially every minister of Christ. Number one, the word of God. The word of God. Number two, intercessory prayer. Number three, a godly life. Number four, a sacrificial life, a costly life. Now, let's look, first of all, at the word of God. Um, go with me for just a second to Second Timothy, to a passage that you all know. Second Timothy, chapter three. Verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. There's no other book. There's no other writing. There is nothing on this planet that can give a person wisdom leading to salvation except the word of God. We don't need culture. We don't need psychology. We don't know, need the insights from some other religion. We do not need to pollute our ministry. With outside sources, there is only one source, and it is the word of the living God, the scriptures, the Bible. I mean, look, look at look at Germany. Look at Europe. Look at the United States. When when was there powerful moves of God? When were there people, masses of people fearing God and walking in holiness? When it was when the ministers of Christ were truly converted 
and believed that every word of the book was the word of the living God. When did all that decline? What was the moment that it declined? What was the moment that it started falling away? The moment the ministers of Christ betrayed Christ and doubted his book or added something else to his book. And those men are no better than Judas. And they destroyed societies. Ungodly, unbelieving ministers have done more damage to Germany and Europe and the United States and the world than any other doctrine or, or belief system that's out there. And notice, too, that these men who do not believe the Bible to be the word of God, they never build a church. They never plant a church. They go into a church and a church building that has been planted by godly ministers who believe the word of God and they take it over and they destroy it. And they turn it in to a wasteland of nothing but jackals. And if you if you do not adhere to the word of the living God, then you have no business in the ministry. You're, you're a tool of the devil. I can tell you that you are a tool of the devil. If you doubt this book, if you believe a part of it, please go away to some island where there are no people. And preach to no one. It's only this book. And, and look, Germany, in your own history. <clears throat> the world was changed. Was changed by what happened in Germany, was it not? It was. And what were those men like? They were men who stood on the word of God and would die before they would betray one word of the living God. And those are the type of men we need to be. It's amazing here in the United States, those of us who love Jesus, we don't study your liberal theologians. We don't study your textual criticism, guys. We don't read their biographies. We don't care. We study the Germans who believed that the word of God was the word of God and were willing to die for it. That's who we study. We have pictures of Germans hanging in our offices. The ones who believed in God's word. And that's the type of men I want to be. And it's the type of men all of us must be. Now, he says here, <coughs> all, sprit, all scripture is inspired by God. It's God breathed, came out of the mouth of God. If anyone says anything else, they are not a Christian. Because how can you be a follower of Christ and not believe Christ? Christ himself in the temptation said that a man will live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that's the scriptures. So the scriptures here, it says that they are inspired. If you don't believe that, you cannot be a minister of Christ. But also, I want you to know if they are inspired or since they are inspired. There are two other words we can use. They are inerrant and they are infallible. Inerrant means that they have no error. Infallible, they are not capable of error. So he goes on and he says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching. We need to teach the Bible. No one needs our wisdom. No one even needs our experiences. No one needs to hear about our life stories. God needs a group of men who stand before other men. And when they open up their mouth, they have one purpose to proclaim what God has said and to make it known, to explain it. It's good for teaching, but it's also good for reproof and for correction. Any minister who does not clearly rebuke people 
and correct them is a coward and is loveless. He loves himself more than he loves the people. He wants people to like him. And that's his goal. But we must teach the truth. We must also tell people they are wrong. And then we must tell people what they must do to be right. That is our task. And that is why, in many cases, the world hates us. Do you know why Europe hates Christianity, true Christianity? For the same reason the United States hates true Christianity. Because we're the only ones telling it it's wrong. And that's the greatest crime you can commit today. Christians, ministers of Christ that are true, are standing up and telling the world, you are wrong. And they hate us. Because when they're all together, their conscience is not afflicted. And then we show up and tell them they're wrong. And the Holy Spirit convicts their hearts. And they hate it. That's why the two witnesses in the book of Revelation... When they die, the world is happy because finally the word of God is silenced and no one is afflicting the conscience of the world anymore. There's peace, peace, because the witnesses of Christ have gone away. Now we can live in our sin and live in our rebellion and we don't have to have any affliction of heart because there's no voice of God on the planet. What's sad is that many people can go into an evangelical church and experience the same. The minister may even teach good theology, but he never tells people they're wrong. He never corrects them. But that's part of teaching and then training, 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 teaching people how to live these things. Let me give you an example. We use so many phrases that are biblical, but because we do not explain them, it's like empty rhetoric. What do I mean? We say things like, keep your eyes on Jesus, or it's all about the gospel, or walk in the spirit. But if we're not able to explain biblically what that means, it'll be nothing more than empty rhetoric that the congregation will never be able to live out. When I was a young Christian, I went to hear a preacher. And he preached adamantly for about an hour and a half about how we should walk in the spirit. And he rebuked us for not walking in the spirit. And he preached very, very strong. After the sermon, I went up to him. And I said, dear sir. I appreciate what you said. I agree. I want to walk in the spirit. But I'm not sure what that means. Or how to do it. And he got very angry with me and accused me of being divisive. Fortunately, there was an older believer standing behind me and he put his arm on my shoulder and he pushed me out of the way. And he confronted that preacher and he said, that young man was not divisive. He asked you an honest question. He asked you, what does it mean to walk in the spirit? You did not answer him because I believe you could not answer him. You were telling us to do something that you don't even know what it means. We don't want to be guilty of that as ministers of Christ. When we tell people what they're supposed to do, we ought to tell them what it means and how it is to be done and how they can grow in it. That's why the minister of Christ spends so many hours a day alone studying scripture. Because many of God's people who love Jesus Christ do not have the time because of their other professions to do so. And so God has entrusted that to us. <clears throat> now. <clears throat> I want you to look at verse 17. So that the man of God may be adequate. Equipped for every good work. Now the one thing. There's so much here. But the one thing that I want to teach you. Is this. The scriptures, if you tell me that you believe the scriptures are inspired. 
If you tell me you believe the scriptures are inerrant and infallible, let me share something with you. I will not be impressed because there's one more thing that you're going to have to tell me. Because if you do not tell me that one more thing, then all the other things you've told me mean nothing. They won't work themselves out in the practical life. You must believe that the scriptures are inspired, that they are inerrant, that they are infallible, and you must believe that the scriptures are sufficient. Do you hear me? Sufficient. You do not need to add to the scriptures. And you have no right to do church according to the way you think you ought to do church. You have no right to let the people do church according to the way they think church ought to be done. It is the church of the living God. And he has not asked you to design it. It is the church of the living God. You are a steward and nothing more. And it is required of a steward to do only one thing, to clearly communicate the commands of his Lord. The minister of Christ does not need some extra philosophy. They do not need special evangelistic strategies or missionary strategies from the United States. And we do not need to go around learning different social constructs in order to be able to minister to people correctly. We believe the scriptures are sufficient, sufficient for faith and practice. Now, I am a man who suffers many maladies. I live in chronic pain. My knee is down here right now really hurting. I've just had my knee replaced. I've had both hips replaced. I have metal in my arm. I'm in my wrist. <laughs> I need doctors for that. In the physical realm, in the medical realm, I do need doctors. I need accountants. I need uh, lawyers. I need all sorts of things. But when it comes to faith and practice and the church, I need the scriptures. And nothing should be taken away from Scripture. You have no right to not do something Christ has commanded in the church. And you have no right to do something he has not commanded. And that is extremely important, gentlemen. Everything we say we believe about the Scriptures does not matter if we do not practice sufficiency of Scripture. I go to churches and they claim to be biblical. I look at their elders and they're not elder qualified. I look at their members and realizing they're not practicing church discipline. I listen to their worship and realize that it's extremely worldly. And it plays upon the emotions of people. Yet they claim to love the scriptures and I think they do, but they don't understand. <clears throat> that the one who says the Bible's inspired is not the one blessed by God, but the one who practices the inspired word. L let me show you something in, in uh, 1 Timothy. Go with me to 1 Timothy. Chapter 3. Now Paul in verses uh, 1 through 13 is talking about the qualifications non-negotiable qualifications of an elder and non-negotiable qualifications of a deacon. Then he goes on in verse 14 and he says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. Now, 15 is the important part. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Now, I want you to look at this. The church is called the household of God. It is not your household. It is not your church. You are a steward and nothing more. Now, the question is, 
How can a man know how to conduct himself in the household of God? There's only one way. Paul says it here. I write these things to you. We can know how to conduct ourselves and how to conduct the church only through what is written. That is it. Not through clever leadership strategies. Not through clever church growth strategies. We don't make a church look really worldly so that it. It attracts worldly men. We don't throw out the things we're supposed to do in church because carnal people don't like them. In our church here in in uh, in Radford, Christ Church of Radford. The elders have ordered the service in such a way that you're going to know. There's only one thing you're going to really get in our church. And that is Jesus Christ. Our church starts on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And it begins with one hour of corporate prayer. And then the singing of hymns and then one hour of, of exposition and then a meal. So many people have told us, man, your church is wonderful, but that hour of prayer, it's just. You know, you guys pray on Sunday, you have prayer meetings on Wednesday, you have special meetings of prayer and, you know, just that that's just too much. But Jesus said his house would be a house of prayer. And so we're not going to make the church. According to what the carnal heart desires. But according to what God has commanded. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have an hour worth of prayer. My only point is this. So many people will come to church if you will entertain them. So many people will come to church if you move their emotions, if you meet their needs. And so many will walk away when you determine you're going to give them Christ. And he's going to be the attractant and no one else, nothing else. So this is what he tells Timothy, and it's so important. Timothy, if you want to know what you're supposed to do in the church, it is through what I have written. Now, I want to go quickly. Um, the other weapon that is so extremely important and so neglected is that of intercessory prayer. Brothers. Someone asked me one time a question, and I remember answering them this way. The flesh is a really good indicator about what you ought to be doing as a Christian minister. The flesh is a really good indicator and guide with regard to what you should make a priority in your life. And the believers, the uh, young men I that I was speaking with, they said, how can that be? How can you say that? That the flesh is a good indicator of what we ought to be doing. And I said, well, just find the things that your flesh hates the most. Find the things that your flesh hates the most. And pretty much that'll be what God wants you to be doing. But it's clear in the word. We are to devote ourselves to the study of Scripture and the proclamation of Scripture. And we are to devote ourselves to prayer. In Acts chapter six. The apostles cared about the needs of the widows, but they did not lay down their ministry in order to wait on tables. They said, we will devote ourselves. To prayer. And the word and notice they said prayer before they said the word. I think that's very, very important. It doesn't mean that prayer is more important than scripture, but it, we have a tendency to study the scriptures a lot and pray very little. And it helps us to see, no, they are on equal footing. We shouldn't abandon one for the sake of the other. If you pray all the time without the scriptures, eventually you are going to go to go astray and fall into fanaticism. If you study the scriptures all the time and do not pray, you're going to become cold. 
and powerless. We need to be men who devote ourselves to the study of Scripture and to intercessory prayer. Now, I want to divide prayer up into two different categories. <clears throat> Communion and intercession. So many people will tell me, you know, prayer is so hard. And I say to them, well, tell me what your prayer life is like. And they'll say, well, you know, um, interceding for people. And I said, well, that tells me why your prayer life is so difficult, why it's so hard. Intercession is hard work. Intercession is warfare. Intercession is fighting. Intercession is blood, sweat and tears. If all you do is intercession, you will not develop a proper prayer life. And in time, you will not even be praying. Intercession is an important part of prayer, but it's not all that prayer is. Prayer is also communion with God. Walking with God, talking to God, drawing near to God, taking your needs to God. Crying out to God constantly for greater manifestations of his spirit's uh, life and power in you. That's your legacy, according to the new covenant, not just being able to understand God's word, but the fullness and the power of the Holy Spirit. And just because many charismatics twist that and turn it into fanaticism, it doesn't mean it's not in Scripture. You and I should be constantly seeking deeper communion with God. And you and I should be crying out constantly for greater and greater measures and manifestations of, it, of the life and power of the Holy Spirit. We should commune with God, walk with God, wake up in the middle of the night, if we can't sleep, we should be communing with God on our beds. But then there's also intercession. Brethren, God answers prayer and you have not because you ask not. I, I am confessional. I hold to the 1689 London Baptist Confession. I appreciate many other confessions. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe in the decrees of God according to the confessions, the strictest confessions. Yet I also believe, as the confessions do, that you have not because you ask not. I know a case in, in history, and I'm not going to mention names because it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be dignified, it wouldn't be noble. But there was a, a, a ministry, a great preaching ministry. And it went on for years and years and years. And the preacher finally retired and passed away. If I mentioned his name, you would know him. He was replaced by another man. And I believe that that other man failed. And I believe that he failed for this reason. When he got in that pulpit, after he preached all his best sermons, he realized he did not have what it would take to fulfill that pulpit, to fill that pulpit. He did not have what was necessary. He did not have the knowledge, the anointing, the power to fulfill that ministry. And what did he do? He ran after strange fire. He really did. And because of it, the church just fell apart. What should he have done? Recognizing his weaknesses, he should have gone to God day and night, crying out, God, I do not have what I need. I lack so much to fill this great pulpit of a great man of God. Please guide me in my preaching. Strengthen me in my preaching. Give me the power and the life I need. Give me unction. Do whatever is necessary. But instead of going to God and God alone, he went to strange fire to the de detriment of the entire church. You and I are constantly going to be in situations where we are not adequate. And we can go and we can build. We can use false tools, we can use worldly weapons, we can even apply strange fire. But none of it will work. But if recognizing your weakness, you will go alone and be with God. And cry out to him. 
Lord, you've put me in this place. Lord, you've given me this ministry. Lord, I see that I do not have the ability to carry it out. You've got to help me rend the heavens and come down. Not just for five minutes, not just for a day. But persevering and believing prayer and God will honor it. God will honor it. Any man who is mightily used of God, it's because God made that man something more than what he is. It's not because of the man. It's because of the spirit of God. But there is so much, brethren, that you and I do not experience. There is so much usefulness that we'll never see because we do not cry out to God. And then not just for us, but everything in the church. God is a God of miracles. And just because there's so many people today lying and 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 fraudulently making up miracles and, and calling things miracles that are nothing more than emotion. That doesn't mean God is not miraculous. That doesn't mean God doesn't answer prayer. He does in extraordinary fashion. He will answer your praying. He will answer the praying of your congregation if you'll teach your congregation how to pray. That's a weapon of our warfare, brethren. Prayer. And how do you learn to pray? How do you learn how to ride a bike? You pray. Two things. Just read through biblical prayers. Now, I'm not saying read through them, memorize them and repeat them word for word. I'm saying <clears throat> renew your mind in the scriptures. Just read through biblical prayers in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the book of Psalms and in, in the Beatitudes. Paul in Ephesians chapter one and three, read through biblical prayers. And in time, what will happen is. You will be cultivating a Christ like mind with regard to prayer. Renew your mind in the word of God so that you will know what the will of God is and pray according to that will. There is so much that's the will of God that we don't see in our churches because we do not ask. There's so much sanctification that is not in our churches today. Why? Because we're not asking, we're not believing, we're not persevering. Brethren. Even some of the greatest, greatest men. Greatest pulpiteers, many of them on their deathbed say they lamented the fact that they didn't pray as much as they should have. I have never met a man. Dying on his deathbed who was sad that he prayed too much. But I have met many men who were sad because they prayed too little. Oh, the promises of God are far beyond anything. His willingness to show himself strong to those that will that will hide under the shadow of his wing. Expect great things from God according to his promises. And fight in prayer, call out to him. He delights when the watchmen give him no rest. Matthew 18, the unjust judge. The woman wore him out. How much more will God do righteously? Answer the prayers of his people. But when Jesus comes back, will he find anybody believing these things? Will he find you with really, really good theology? And really, really good exposition. But you're not believing him. And you're not believing him because you're not asking. Oh, brother, I'm, I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. Let us give ourselves to prayer. And then finally, with the shortness of time, a godly life. You know, I was at. A, I was at Master's Seminary a few years ago. In California. And I heard something that. I've kind of toyed with it a little bit, and added a few words to it, but I heard something that was so powerful. This is what was said. To the young men who were preparing for the ministry. Basically, what the person said was this. 
You are here to study the word of God, to live the word of God, and to proclaim the word of God. That's why you're here. That's it. Now, that's really close to Ezra. He set his heart to studying the word of God, to obeying it, to teaching it, to making it known throughout all of Israel. And that middle thing there is so important. Jesus said, teach them to observe. He, de he didn't say, teach them to observe all that I commanded them. <coughs> he said, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. So you and I, we must study the word of God. We must live the word of God. We must proclaim the word of God. And not just in the context of public ministry, but especially in our hidden lives. Especially with our wives and our children. Obedience, obedience. Oh, dear brother, and I know I've said a lot today. But these are the things that the lack of these things is what destroys any true work of God. Give yourself to this. Give yourself to only those weapons and God will mightily use you. The word of God, intercessory prayer and a godly life. One man who devotes himself to that is better than 10,000 with all their silly church growth strategies and methodologies of ministry that's nothing more than pragmatism learned from the secular world. All right. Well, I'm finished. <laughs> Brother Peter, are you there? I'm there. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Uh, is, there, is there time for, for questions, maybe? Yes, as long as my voice holds out. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, he never changed his message. He did not give the Jew one message and the Gentile another message. Now, based on what Paul said, you know, if, if you go study at a mission school, uh, they will spend so much time teaching you about culture and how to, you know, just everything about culture. And I appreciate that. We need to know about culture. But, but here's what I've discovered, brother. It's really not that complex. We are commanded to teach the truth, to speak the truth. But how are we to speak it? Especially to the world? In love. In love. And so, if I do not understand all the culture around me, but I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and I'm bearing the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Then when I sit down with a person, I'm going to listen to them. I'm going to discern where, they're, where they are. I'm going to realize that there are some things at this moment they're probably not ready to accept. I'm going to teach them the truth without compromise. And I'm going to be very, very careful and very, very sensitive to their needs. Um, I think that in in second Timothy, um, it says here in verse 23, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. I'm not going to quarrel with someone about some even big issue, but that's not why I'm there. I'm not there to talk about 
uh, society or politics or all the things that are so important to the world. I'm not going to sit down with someone who maybe, you know, is doing drugs and uh, dressed in a horrible fashion and saying all kinds of curse words. I'm not going to sit down with that person and, and say, stop cussing. I'm not going to uh, talk to them about all those types of things. What am I going to do? I'm going to listen to them. And I am going to speak the gospel into their life according to the wisdom that the spirit gives me. With gentleness, he goes on, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. Be kind, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. And so, you know, I am 58 years old and I am not from a major city. I'm from a rural area and a farm. But they ask me every week to go to the university and teach students. I don't have to try to dress like them. I don't even have to know what are all the trends and fads and of student culture. I just have to be a man who loves people, regardless of where they are, who's gentle, who's listening, who's sensitive. Always the same message. Always the same message. Never allowing myself to be pulled into arguments that are just going to lead to more arguments. But with one sole purpose, to communicate clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and, and that's the way I deal with it. Um, that's a great question. Yeah, maybe I will ask it as a question. Um, how would you also reconcile um, you know, what you said and what is in the Bible also with, um, for example, with, with Jesus uh, sometimes really saying really harsh words, making strong yes. accusations. Yeah. One time even taking a whip and cleansing the temple. Yeah. And um, also Paul uh, saying that he will come with a whip. So, yes. Um, You know, that's a that's a great question. And uh, I, I wanted to address it a bit more. I was a little bit worried about making that statement without coming back and talking about sometimes we have to be forceful. Um, but first of all, let me give you something that I think is very, very important. Usually when we see a man, whether it's myself or whoever, especially younger minister, we are given to extremes, aren't we? Uh, there are some men that are just they're fighters, and that seems to be the thing that you always see in them whenever they're preaching. Then there are men who are very gentle and maybe to a fault because they do not confront, they do not fight. But if you go to the book of Jude, first of all, I think we need to lay this foundation in the book of Jude. Uh, verse three. He said, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation. So what was what was the norm for Jude's ministry? What did Jude, what did he desire to do all the time? And what was it that you was most prominent in Jude's ministry? It was this. He loved and wanted to talk about our common salvation. OK, that that's what he did. That's what characterized his life was talking about our common salvation, teaching people the gospel and the word of God. He was not a contentious man. Do you see that? But then he goes on and he said, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now, Jude, I think, gives us a perfect example of what we see in Jesus. Jude was not a contentious man. Christ was not crying out in the streets. Jude was not a contentious man. 
If you looked at his life and ministry, it was one of simply making known the salvation of God in the gospel. But there were times, Jude said, but now at this moment, I see the necessity to tell you, you must contend. And then he says some very, very hard things about the false prophets and the false uh, people who had snuck into the church. And so if, if I see a man who every time he teaches, it is contending, it is fighting, it is just that's all he does, that's a red flag for me. But if I see a minister who is never contending and never fighting and never standing his ground and never in conflict, that's a red flag also. We ought to be marked as men who are gospel men, who are loving men, kind men, who will go the extra mile. But every once in a while, we have to draw a line in the sand and we have to fight. Now, um, I remember one time I was asked to go to this very large church that had really blown up. It was it was a really terrible situation. And um, after being there for a few months, trying to fix everything, um, I called a friend of mine who's older than me and I said, I'm at a crossroads. If I do this, they've threatened a lawsuit against me. If I do this, many people in the church are going to leave. If I do this, this is going to happen. And my friend wisely said to me, you are already wrong. You're wrong. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it doesn't matter if they bring a lawsuit against you. It doesn't matter if many of these people leave. It doesn't matter this other thing. The only thing that matters is you do what God commands in Scripture. That's all that matters. I was younger then. He was right. Yes, brother, there are times when you must stand your ground. I remember as a young minister in Peru, a pastor. I was a pastor. I wasn't even 30 years old. And these three men walked into my congregation. And uh, they looked at me. They were very intimidating, very very frightening. And and they said, where's the pastor? And I said, I'm the pastor. And I could see that they laughed. You know, you're a little boy, this, that. And they tried to intimidate me from the very beginning. And they said, um, we're prophets and we've come here to prophesy in your church. And I said, that is absolutely wonderful. And so they got all excited. And I said, here's what we're going to do. You stay here in our church for six months to a year. And when I can observe your fruit and see that you are truly a man, men of God, then maybe you can say something to the congregation. And they I, I thought they were going to get violent. But I had to stand my ground until finally some other men got around me and we moved them out of the building. I was preaching at another time and a cult walked into the church while I was praying in front of the people, while I was praying, a man much larger than me, I felt somebody tugging on my arm while I was praying. I looked up and it was a man much larger than me. I looked up and he said, we've come here to uh, basically take over the church. We're prophets and we're, we've come to do this. And I said, I don't care who you are. You're only going to do one thing. You're going to get down off this platform right now, or I will take you down from this platform. I was wondering how I was going to do it. But yes, you have to stand your ground. You have to stand your ground against evil. And it may cost you everything. And know this, that when you do stand your ground, getting beat up will not be the painful part. Do you want to know what the painful part's going to be? Slander. Slander. When they take your good name and they twist everything about you and communicate it to the world, you must stand your ground. But if you're a man who's always fighting, you've got a problem. That's a great question. Hey, uh, I think
think the guy who came up in your church was a German, right? I think he yeah, was. he was. <laughs> a big German. <laughs> willingness to serve us at all was a privilege for us. Um, maybe you could uh, close in prayer with us. Yes, I will. But I'd like to say this. Um, since since our last conversation, Peter, uh, in um, Spain, I guess it was. I want you to know that you've made me think about a lot of things and you really helped me. And um, I just praise God for you and for Tobias and your desire to in good conscience, do what you think is scripture. And uh, I just want you to know that I watch from afar and um, you have really, uh, you've, you've really been a great influence. Thank you. So um, I appreciate that. You too, Tobias. <laughs> Father, I, I thank you so much for this great privilege. So much. Lord, bless these men. Lord, such a legacy in Germany. So many men you have raised up to be a blessing to the world. I pray, Lord, that you would repeat that pattern. That men that trust in nothing but you and your word and proclaim your word and make Christ preeminent in their lives and ministries. Please, Lord, raise up men like this in Germany and Europe, in the United States, the world. And Father, help us by your grace that we finish the race as we ought. We are so needy, Lord, in Jesus name. Amen.